Mod Morgan for the Egyptian Magic Podcast and today I'm talking mostly about the deity Anubis <coughs> whose um, sacred month in the ritual year that I follow kind of falls lunar month of course fall, <coughs> falls about now uh, and I was just checking because every now and again because because this uh, ritual calendar that I have been working with and promulgating for an, a number of years some people uh, it's, it's always good to explain you know, right, the, the reasoning behind it all and, and why I place things the way I do uh, the taking as read most most of this argumentation is is set out in a in a book that I wrote called the wheel of the year or the ritual year in ancient Egypt um, and I carried over quite a lot of the material into the other book um, the Egyptian magic book I probably repeated it these things it it's uh, but more of the uh, deep explanation of it, the actual rationale of it, is uh, in, contained in the uh, Ritual Year book. So, it, which kind of prompted me to kind of look at it myself, really, and uh, remind myself why I called it that, uh, which is appropriate. So this this month, sort of December, January. Uh, because it's a lunar month, of course, so it, it's not exactly the same as uh, the, the the months of the civil calendar that we kind of more familiar with. It's following an underlying lunar cycle, which was an older way in which the Egyptians structured their ritual year. Um, probably quite early on, really, they abandoned that uh, that that way of looking at things in the, about the same time as they built the uh, the first of the really big pyramids. Anyway, there you go. So this month would have been uh, called in the sort of Greek old version of the Egyptian months, uh, Mechir, or Machir, if you like, which means the Feast of Clothing. Uh, now, there's an older name, there's an even older name for that. The Egyptian name would have been Rechwir, which, which means the Great Fire Festival, meaning it's a time in which uh, the fields, there's nothing growing in all the fields in Egypt, uh, but there was a practice of, of burning the, um, the kind of remaining stubble, if you like, to sort of get rid of any pests and prepare it for, for the new planting. I remember one of the first times I went to Egypt, I was very struck by the fact that, which was was about this time of year, that they were still doing the same thing. The smoke was rising from the fields and, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, as, as in the ancient world, it was a kind of direct connection, really. So that, that was rather nice. That was the meaning of the festival. But... One of the other meanings, this Feast of Clothing, is probably connected, you, well, there's a couple of different things, but <coughs> both of which connect us with the cult of uh, Anubis, whose uh, month is placed, outplaced here. One of which is the kind of process of mummification. Is When they're talking about clothing in an Egyptian context, they're talking about the process of mummification. And the process of mummification is very connected with uh, the god uh, Anubis, who's often shown kind of actually doing the mummification. It's sometimes said that the people who did the mummification at certain taboo points in the process, they actually wore masks to... Uh, representing the image of uh, Anubis. May you guard your chest, may your voice be loud and your throats truthful. May this image you guard be concealed. May you spread your wings and do your duties that I may pass by you in peace. Okay, so uh, uh, talking about the 
the month of uh, known as Mechia or Mechia, the or Requia is another more Egyptian version of it. The first one is more of a, a Greekified version of that name. The Great Fire Festival. Uh, as I say, when I first went to Egypt, the first time I ever went there, one of the things I really noticed was because it was at this time, very time of year, that they were burning the stubble in the fields. And that's obviously what's meant by the fire festival associated with this month. So that's the kind of agricultural meaning for it. But as all of the months in this cycle instantiate a particular or bear, hold within them the mythology of particular gods and goddesses of the Egyptian tradition, this one is associated, I have made it associated with the god Anubis, who is a very, very important god. And that's because the name Mech, Machir, Machir, Requir can mean something to do with clothing. Clothing or bandaging or mummification. So mummification gives us a direct link to Anubis, who's very associated with the process of mummification. He's often shown doing that. And in fact, the priests who engaged in the process of mummification, the experts on that, they... Uh, sometimes so it said war well, mass in the form of anubis this uh, figure so there's there's a great link there so clothing mummification the the other link with uh with the with this word with this month is that makia could could mean something to do with the skin so clothing in the sense of the thing that covers you and this issue of the skin is something that connects the cult of Anubis and uh, actually Set. And then you can see this because there's this very odd uh, fetish object or object that you often see in tomb scenes uh, without any necessarily any explanation of what it is because it looks so odd. Uh, but it's always there, right, on the floor, you know, and uh, I'll show some images of that. And that is actually a representation of the skin of Anubis. So we can say from that that, that Anubis is some, some, a god who can change his skin. Actually, the thing is put there as a reminder of the fact that he once did this, or he allowed his skin to be taken over by Set. Uh, set in one piece of mythology was pursuing Osiris to do him some more damage and he wanted to stop the process of mummification. Uh, and also some reasons why Set might not have uh, wanted mummification. The, set, the Setians actually didn't believe in mummification. They had a different process uh, of treating their dead. It's more natural and more about returning it to the earth. So it doesn't necessarily uh, mean he's uh, on the face of it he's got bad intent but it's usually assumed that he did he wanted to enter the the chamber where the mummification was taking place uh and the only way he could do this is to take on the form of anubis uh which he did and but was found out and uh was was a, a spell before he could do too much damage but anubis was also punished for his allowing this process to happen and uh, he both gods in fact uh, at some point in their mythology in various places lose their skin they are skinned and uh, the skin of set and the skin of uh, anubis is used for various things in the ritual structure as a memory of that day but psychologically we might say that that process of skinning or shape shifting or skin shifting is very much to do with the ability of both gods but especially anubis to move from one realm to another and that's one of the most important functions of anubis is as a uh, rather grandly called a psychopomp uh, like a, a shaman in a way would be a kind of another term we might use these days to describe that function of, of moving from one realm to another 
of taking messages from one realm to another, of bringing, of guiding people between the realms. Uh, all of these different functions are laid out in the rituals that are connected particularly with this um, time of year, with this particular lunar month. So I'll talk a little bit about those now. The rituals are laid out in in the book, uh, The Ritual Year in Ancient Egypt, but also in the Egyptian magic um, sort of grimoire, that, or book that I kind of constructed for this sort of system with all this ritual in. And that one, they progress a little bit. I've been going through this cycle with people for a number of years now. And... Oh, that was the chair creaking, incidentally. Uh, and as what as the, the way magic goes, it, it tends to be you have to go through a ritual a number of times before it it really it, it gets better each time, I suppose you'd say, and it develops. And so there's some element of development in the, the other versions of of the rituals and maybe some extra rituals that, that I slotted in there. So January December, January type this this festival for Anubis, also for another wolf-like entity called Wet Wawet, who is to, again to do with kind of going out into territories, but primarily uh, Anubis. So there are two rituals that I transcribe. One which you might easily do, not easily, but you you could do by yourself, which also involves the the god Set. Uh, let's say Anubis is the child, it's usually said to be the child of Osiris and Nephis, uh, because Osiris is more well known as the consort or husband of, of Isis, but and Nephis is, is his sister-in-law, I suppose you'd say, technically paired off with Set. And so this shift of alliance of Nephis to Osiris is sometimes advances one of the reasons for sets kind of rage I, I suppose and anger with osiris uh there are lots of different kind of versions of the same story but there's, there's a possibility anyway this spell involves oasis water or a special water anything that comes from the oasis would you you'd think has a connection with the god set who's particularly associated with, with the desert and his oasis and many of the best uh records of set come from the oasis but you need this oasis water or water from a holy well would do it i think that's a possibility i've got we use some water that we got from the iron rich the red spring at uh at glastonbury that someone brought for us uh as i say set is able to take on the form of uh, of, of anubis so in this spell uh, which is connected, as I say, with the uh, decans as well, interestingly enough. And as well as celebrating on the full moon, uh, uh, Egyptians, s certain special rituals were done uh, at, either at the beginning or end of, of, of each of, day, of their decan or week, which is of 10 days, rather in the same way that people have one day in the week, uh, I, the Sabbath, if you like, the Sabbath day, the seventh day, which is in uh, that system derived ultimately from Babylonia, the week has seven days. Because it, the original or, or another version of this, the Egyptian version, has a week of 10 days. So this 10 day period, which is the, the decans, the end of it is the occasion to do a special ritual that kind of reprises the process of creation. This is something I only recently was lucky enough to discover that this happens, that the a god such as Amun, a creator deity, will have 10 different souls or spheres that over the period that are the 10 different spheres of creation itself. So the second day may be the moon. Other days may be particular types of vegetation or creatures of the waters and, or of the air. 
so there's a, there's a great parallel there so the, in this ritual which is quite simple apart from knowing this sort of stuff you have the water you make a an egg a creative egg but out of asses dung and an ass or a donkey is a well-known avatar of the god set and so this substance can be flung into the water as a way of ridding yourselves of bad influences one way or another so that's a kind of simple spell that i set out in the, in the kind of collection of liturgy and spells that i suggest that i use myself and i've been collecting and that other people might find useful the second spell is more of a two-hander or multi-hander uh, a group ritual in effect but certainly for two people and this is the 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 long ritual i give a few readings from this you know the one that begins hail thou soul god anubis is quite a long ritual it comes from the late the end what of egypt from the later part of egypt from a, a collection of spells known as the uh to some people as the greek magical papyri or just the magical papyri which are really formularies and spells and grimoires from uh, egypt's history and it's been recognized that they are miniature versions of um temple ritual so the temple ritual which was kind of in a bit of decline become simplified and miniaturized made into these sort of mini ver handleable versions that a, a small group of people in a domestic house or in, in out in the, the countryside can undertake without all the the complicated paraphernalia that you might need in temple ritual which was becoming less and less available and was not available at all eventually so this is like a ritual from a mystery cult but the rituals undertaken history cults were derived from ultimately from Egyptian temple ritual, but in a kind of simplified form. So it's perfectly legitimate in ancient ritual to simplify and shorten things and cut to the chase, uh, which is kind of pretty much what we do as well. So these things are kind of made for us to use. It's a long ritual involving a priest uh and a medium and perhaps a certain amount of other congregation we do it with whoever we've got there uh who has questions that they want to put to uh, various gods and goddesses of the tradition and anubis acts uh, in his role as psychopomp moving between the worlds the medium taking on or being possessed or being a vessel for anubis in which role having invoked anubis anubis goes out and brings in other deities uh, who can then be questioned uh, you, in the form of an art they can maybe utter an oracle or you can ask a direct question and usually the medium in the form of Anubis will interpret, will channel what these other deities have to say. So it's very productive. The ritual itself, most of the words of the ritual you can use, they're invocations, and some of them are more like a record of how it went last time. Uh, because essentially it, it develops into a, a, a trance um a trance session you know well obviously that's going to vary each time but whoever recorded the ritual again kind of recorded what happened to them i think that's the way of looking at it but as within all egyptian rituals there's they, they've always got different levels of enactment that one can can undertake uh, you it can be a description it's like a picture an image of something essentially is what a description is just by repeating uh, the description in a sense you're also reenacting it so when we do this uh, we do kind of a, a bit of both really a bit of 
improvisation and channeling a new and a bit of repeating of the formulas of the past um, because it, it's quite a tricky process to to get this to work and as I say as a result it's, it's, it's a pretty long ritual uh, can be quite tiring and eventually the the medium will indicate that uh, Anubis all the different things uh, there's a food offering in it which is quite an important element of uh, any Egyptian ritual there has to be this transaction of food uh, of entertaining of the, the spiritual entities that you, you want to question and eventually they leave Anubis uh, leaves as well or is, you give the license to depart uh, from the ancient world, they always had a license to depart in which you bid farewell to Anubis, who's done such a good job for you uh, in his role as wolf and dog and uh, guardian king of the underworld. Uh, and then all the ritual equipment is, is ended. So this is the work of um, this month. is is connected with God Anubis, one of the most attractive and... Uh, productive, interesting uh, of, of Egyptian deities. And, um, you know, I hope you'll enjoy that. The other work, um, I seem to have done a quite a lot of recording and uh, creation of material uh, this month, a lot. Perhaps there is no coincidence as, uh, once you begin to think about uh, Anubis, uh, things do come through. Uh, and, and this has certainly been happening. I've been working on the, trying to explain as well the, the way that we approach magic, taking on the Egyptian uh, point of view, which is very immersive. It's a very immersive thing. It's very based on, well, it's image magic. For, for, for them, it, it, the visual field, the visual culture of Egypt is no coincidence because vision and the vision thing is is very much uh magic is not it is not some sideline for them magic is the thing that everybody is actually immersed in whether they like it or not that is the world the world is this magical space this 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 visual space that you you you're in whether you like it or not but also you've got some ways of uh changing that or understanding the way it flows so that you can go with that particular flow um, and that is the Egyptian view so that's why which explains as well I suppose why a ritual gesture of some sort is is important to, to, to magic you're creating an assemblage you're creating an image um, and that is 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 you can avoid doing that, whatever, but you may as well just face up to it and make the gesture. That is the magic of Anubis. So I think I'm, I've got a few other things to add to this. Well, at least a, a good friend, uh, William, has uh, done a little reading of uh, something he wrote in connection with uh, Baphomet, who being kind of quite dark and silvery and black and that reminds me as well of, of Anubis um, and I'm not sure it quite, quite came up but it just seemed right really that we we give you this voice offering okay so this is called nothing good has ever been written about Baphomet The eagle faces the bull. Winged and hooved, he sits, black candle aflame. The lion faces the angel, the sphinx of the sands, proud and contemplative. The angel above is man below, the liminal gate of the goatfish, his beginning and his end. Non-being is ablaze with darkness as the moon flickers. Totalis... T -t -t totality resides in a box 
in a wood panelled room. On a table sits this box. We open the box to seek the head of Baphomet within. We find it, for inside is another wood panelled room. On a table sits a box. All God's creatures and all God's men, he takes them apart and puts them back together again. Fire on the head atop the lily, air his wings, water her scales, earth its cloven hoofed posture. As of meditation, the oneness is kept in motion, still. Procreative caduceus seeds itself. All the colours are purple as blackness is light. The shortest day, the longest night. Winter solstice, eternal, as the breath of nothingness bleeds. Creative destruction, necessary deeds. Hail, Baphomet! Anubis has uh, an ambiguous, very ambiguous uh, quality to him, uh, so much so that he sometimes think think of him as kind of a, a tamed form or set. Uh, and while I'm thinking about that, I should say as well that um, I mentioned the companion of set and also uh, Knight of Shambhala, which is a kind of uh, Hindu, more of a Hindu kind of magical um, thread within the kind of magic that I do and uh, I run a, a forum on Facebook called uh, Umukos Tantra, so Tantra is another kind of more recent name for that kind of thing and Tan you know so I, I run both things alongside now I, I obviously if if you know there's always an over in my view there's an overlap between the, the two systems they're both kind of the tantric and the the hindu uh, sorry the egyptian magic so that i've been kind of bringing that out more really and one of the projects that i'll kind of share with you eventually is this idea of a, t a tantra of the egyptians because it's, it's getting kind of so much material now it's it's an interesting way to do it. So just as I talk about the ritual year, in my kind of uh, managing of the uh, Mukos group, I, <clears throat> I also kind of work with a uh, ritual year. I think this, this concept uh, of the ritual year of a cycle, of a large cycle over the course of, of at least a year and uh, the shorter cycle over the, the course of a month it is... An amazing key to magic, really. I've been another subject that I'll share with you a uh, future time is to do with, I suppose, alchemy. What they call alchemy or psychophysical alchemy is very, very close to the idea of, of tantra. You can, in fact, I would say it, it. One important interpretation of alchemy is as a kind of uh, a tantric art, really. Uh, so I was I was working on that and you know it occurred to me that yeah no what, what I was going to say I, I was working on this kind of um, alchemy thing and in these texts these sort of uh, Roman in from Roman Egypt they specifically say says this guy Sosimus that the ritual year or the cycle the cosmic cycle of planets of decans of the ebb and flow of the moon uh the incredibly important in in the alchemy that, that they practice in fact he doesn't think that the alchemy even when it's in the more physical uh manifestation in terms of uh tinting metals coloring metals which is one of the kind of things making gold really even in that even when it looks like it's just physical manipulation of stuff the, the ritual year is very, very important. So all these different threads are coming together and I'm kind of um, interpreting them for you over the, the coming period. Anyway, so I should say as well, in this, strangely enough, in the Tantric tradition, even though their month is not connected particularly with uh, Anubis, but the, the, the cult of Anubis and the, and the dog people is so important in the ancient world the, a major centre of uh, what you would call the dog people or, yeah, the dog people or the kind of uh, mother of dogs and all this sort of stuff is 
in India itself. Now, some of this is kind of seems like a tall story. It's kind of the sort of crazy things that are said in Europe about things that happen in the east, you know, on the far reaches of the empire as was, when people don't really know what's going out going on but it is a notable phenomena that uh, this uh, mythology to do with dogs and the experts on the era do think that there's some transference of the cult of the connected with the dog uh, or wolf into India and the, the story that I was also looking at this, this time is that see dogs are quite um, taboo really outcast representatives of outcasts within Indian society I think in a lot of other societies as well in in the Middle East there's this sort of a very ambiguous relationship between them and that, and that would be the same for Anubis as well his original role is quite taboo uh, within uh, Egyptian culture he is almost like a demon that's been tamed and brought on side as are a lot of the Egyptian gods and goddesses, they have this kind of quite dark history or interest in history, taboo history, the further you go back. And it it seems clear that before, right at the beginning of the Pharaonic culture, or perhaps even before, before the formation of Egypt as a, as a nation state, the, what they usually call in their mythology, the unification of the North and South, people buried their dead um, in the desert. They, they, they've probably practiced something you might call sky burial, basically, judging by these very, very old records. They may even have, yeah, they may have just left the corpses in the, to, to be dismembered by the elements, to return to the elements. And part of the process of that would be being eaten by uh, wild dogs. And if you go to Egypt, there's actually quite a lot of wild dogs, quite, some of them quite dangerous in, in the desert areas if you, if you wander out of the cultivated strip for not very far. Yeah, it can be quite uh, easy to be confronted by semi-wild feral dogs, which are very beautiful, but also quite um, scary, dangerous uh, canids in the in in the desert area this this all kind of links with uh, the setting thing so you you have these representations one of the earliest representations of the god anubis is as a kind of tomb really you're you're a, a tomb inside the dog in, in a sense because you've been eaten by the dog and i suppose over time people change the meaning of that to to make anubis this, to give him this connection with death and the transference, the passage over from the world of the living to the world of the dead, the transition. And it's, it, it was a, an amazing coincidence when I read this thing called the, the Paw, Paw's Trident or the Trident Paw, which is a story within the Indian tradition where, where dogs also have this role of... Um, bringing people from one realm to another and you've got this character who's been abandoned in the in the wilderness in the Indian tradition and maybe he's 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 been killed he's been left for dead by uh, the lawmakers of the time and a dog comes along meaning to eat the body and scratches him and makes a sign of three th of three uh, scratch marks on his forehead by accident before he eats him really and that sign happens to be the sign of the god Shiva so he marks in effect he marks the course with the sign of the god Shiva so when the 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 uh, what would you call Shiva's messengers arrive to take the corpse away to the underworld basically they see this sign so instead they think, oh, well, he's been marked, hasn't he? He's been marked by Shiva. So would they take him to heaven instead, even though he'd probably, in terms of karma and all the rest, he doesn't really deserve to go to heaven, but he's got the mark on him. So he's been kind of initiated and helped uh, 
to go to the other world by this kind of outcast dog and that theme in India is quite a kind of potent one really there's quite a lot you can say about that it's not the subject that we're really going to talk about today but I was very struck by that and I kind of thought it's time to kind of bring all these threads together and write something about the Tantra of the Egyptians which I'll share some of that with you at another time but I just thought I'd say that I've made a start and Anubis is obviously going to play a role in that so uh, as you can guess already Anubis is an incredibly ancient uh, entity uh, natural entity a kind of uh, some say he's a wolf, some say he's a jackal, some say he's a bit of both, a dog, a dark dog. And you see these amazing images of Anubis sitting on a kind of chest. Uh, one of the things that that amazing prayer for Anubis to protect the canoptic chest comes from this book, uh, the Amduat, uh, The Great Awakening. And you can see the picture of that I'm talking about Anubis. The classic image from the tomb of Tutankhamun uh, of Anubis on top of a, a chest and I think in the chest were all sorts of funeral remains uh, that he he's particularly tasked with with guarding. Just mention another deity was very very important and often confused with Anubis or maybe it is the same entity which is Wet Wawet, uh, the opener of the ways, who is usually Anubis, not in a funeral context, but in the sense of opening, usually kind of in in, in the sense of uh, a battle or whatever, sort of going onto the field and uh, opening the ways. But there, there's obviously a relationship there, it's the one who kind of mediates, the one who opens the door in one way. You see, uh, all of these ideas would fit with the, the the cult connected with the with the funeral or the alchemical process that's taking place because this is also where alchemy is is created within the embalming room and all these different gods interacting with each other uh, there are many many famous issues uh, images of uh, Anubis that you can sort of locate and I'll show you a few of those okay so in the ritual, which we'll we'll have another go, it start like like all of these rituals. Uh, I recommend that people do an opening of some sort, um, and there's a sort of standard tankem opening, which is which I call that you know, for which is based again on material from the uh, the magical papyri. And because it largely uses raw sounds rather than specific uh, words from a any particular language, they're just phonemes, they're strings of phonemes. This kind of uh, banishing, oh no, banishing, I shouldn't call it a banishing, it's just as it gets, you get the words that it, it's an opening. The idea is not necessarily a banishing, a banishing is another thing we, the last thing we want to do now is is banish things we want them to come <laughs> you know i suppose the idea of your purification maybe sometimes banishing maybe is something you might do at the end of the ritual uh, but basically that the opening uses sounds and it can work within any tradition because these sounds these raw phonemes exist pretty much in all languages, the mysteries of them and the mystery of sound and these vowel sounds and vowel chanting exists within the tantric tradition as well, which we're kind of using as a counterpoint to the Egyptian material. So the ritual, so you do the, the opening, the ritual starts with uh, a number of people. There's a, a priest and there's a medium. And so there's a... a an interchange, a dialectic between the two two people in the ritual, which is a, a common feature of uh, Egyptian rituals. This kind of uh, two two people. Sometimes it's male and female. That's quite a common 
appear in, especially in the later alchemical tradition. Uh, but it, but usually it's two people who cooperate together. Uh, that's the most productive way. So you have solitary rituals. You have rituals between two people, rituals sometimes with three people, and then rituals with a larger group of people, which might be more ecstatic, musical, dance type things. But we're focusing on this ritual in which other people, there can be an audience in the sense of people who have questions but the, at the heart of the ritual are two people the priest and the medium the uh, the anubis in a way and the priest makes an opening address say, saying hail thou soul god thy god of a soul anubis the son of nephis hail holder of the key who sends the phantoms of the dead for my service, in this hour, this very hour, hail Anubis, loyal dog, resting on the box of myrrh, and your feet resting on the frankincense, as a reference to the box or the chest again there. When I make this libation, Anubis, with your fair face, I see you, great God, and with this mask or mark about my head, I am Anubis, master of secrets. So there's a kind of thing about making marks, like, as I say, like in the Indian tradition of the dog making the mark on someone's forehead that marks them out as being one of us or to be taken to the, to the realm of uh, Shiva or whatever. Again, this, this idea is a very common one within the Egyptian idea that you have a certain mark. And there may even be um, a herb. There's a thing called an Anubis herb. Um, I'm not quite sure. It's, 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 they, they, um, it's an eye drop, essentially. I should say that all these things are related to each other The because now we're talking about sort of medical tradition. And Egypt invented this thing called the eye drop, literally an eye dropper, to drop a, a, a very small dose of medicine into your eye for various conditions uh, that one might get, especially in that sort of uh, climate. But the, the Anubis herb is, from the accounts of it, it's probably a mild antiseptic, but it's also the idea of opening the eyes. There's, there's certain ideas what this might be. Uh, I think it's in one account it says stachis root, I uh, which I don't know too much about that. But I suppose the symbolic idea anyway is that the eye drops open the eyes so that they can see as Anubis sees. And obviously dogs are famous for their heightened senses and all the rest of that they see everything so there's this lot I can't, I can't share all of the ritual with you it's extremely long but there's this to in and fro in between the medium and in the form of anubis and the, and the priest kind of making various offerings and talking to the spirit to get it into the right place uh, and sometimes the ritual is spoken and sometimes the ritual is actually whispered as in no good ox herd and obviously because the herder you see open the eyes of the media so they may see uh, oh pure gods of the primal waters i am a child of earth by name under the souls of whose feet the gods of egypt's to egypt our place as anubis i am the one in the shrine so this is kind of oh, Counterplay is an incredibly interesting ritual between the priest slipping from one state to another, sometimes the priest, sometimes taking on the form of Anubis, and then all the way through this, saying in this sort of trance to the medium, uh, open your eyes uh, and tell me what you can see. There's a repeated refrain in this ritual, open your eyes, again, so become a medium, very much an, an Anubis type thing. And this goes on and on until the the medium gets 
you know into the the right trance state that they could they can see these things and sometimes they repeat the stuff and eventually there's a signal from the medium they they, they say be be great be great oh light so they can they can see uh and the priest sort of to to kind of hurry this along says oh darkness remove yourself from him uh, and bring the light to me so then the ritual goes into another phase right an extremely long ritual in which having got into this psychic state uh they can then see the other world they can see the gods and goddesses and anubis role then is to go bring them in uh those who were required and to re to look after them to shepherd them which is his role and to relay any questions that come from the medium from the priest uh, or from the other people who are witnessing the ritual who may have come with material that specific questions they want to ask so this is all the work of the time we're in uh the month of anubis and there's lots of other interesting things connected with this when you when you've been asked uh and having done this myself i can say that as a, uh, if you act as medium is is quite um tiring business it's not something you would want to go on for more than an hour which is the recommended time limit for the entire ritual uh, and that that makes sense because this sort of stuff is can be very very draining so sooner or later everything has to be wound up all the food's been eaten and everything's been drunk and Anubis has asked the gods to return to their domains and it just remains for Anubis to be kind of uh, let go uh, and asked to go and for this there's the uh, a traditional license to depart uh, which we use in other rituals as well it's, it's quite nice uh, where we say farewell farewell anubis uh, the good ox herd you've done well for us you've kind of done the work anubis anubis the son of a wolf and a dog um, senebti which means blessings cherub of amenti which is another name for Anubis king of those in the underworld and the whole thing it will be repeated usually seven times and when it's all up finished it will be you know anything left over will be poured into the earth and the whole thing will be wrapped up and we'll make a note of all the answers and queries we got so you see an incredibly important and popular deity when we've lots of different references and uh, cross fertilization with other traditions and cultures uh, also has the added advantage of being a very ambiguous shape-shifting god always very interested magically with uh, a, a huge ancient history so blessings of anubis uh, uh, as i've already given you for the for the coming month and uh, look forward to more revelations to do with the our good wolfy friend.